My name is Stephen Hill, I'm an English guitar maker living in Spain. I make Spanish guitars, which you'd think would be pretty odd for an Englishman to be making Spanish guitars. Uh, I've got 20 years experience of uh, making my instruments. Uh, about two and a half years ago I decided to move with my family to, to Spain. I live in, in La Radura, which is a small coastal town on the Costa Tropical in Granada province. And a uh, very, very, very nice town set around the bay, Horseshoe Bay. And it's a town that's quite devoted to, to tourism, but it has, I think, uh, it's be, I think it's still one of the last unspoilt um, towns along this stretch of coast, certainly, and with a good, stri strong Spanish community. My workshop is, however, about 20 minutes' drive inland in a small hamlet called El Rescate, which means the rescue. This is a, a small collection of houses, um, ruins, dogs, old people, um, almond trees, olive trees, avocado trees, and my, my little house called Casa del Guitarero. When I first came here, obviously I bought the house as a foreigner, as an English person. And they viewed me with slight suspicion. And as they realised I could speak Spanish, and I wasn't up to no good, they received me quite well and uh, I began to be able to have great conversations with some of the villagers about the history of the place and things. And it used to be a very strong centre. Lots of people came to have dances, village dances. There always used to be lots of fiestas here. People would come with their mules or walking and come and spend the night, probably drink lots of the local wine, which is pretty strong. And when I then moved my workshop here a few months ago, they, in a sense, received me with a, with a different... Um, different quality, realising that, uh, that they were, had in their community someone who came from quite a deep place within their own culture, even though I was English. It was quite a curiosity for them, I think, really. And lots of people have knocked on my door and had a look around, some of the kids around who come up for weekends, and some of the people who live here. And they're quite amazed to see what goes on. And I talk a lot, quite a lot about my work. And it must seem like quite a, a unique thing for them. And also quite a strange thing as well, this foreigner in the village. Well, I think it seems to me, a foreigner, a English, who is here doing guitar in Spanish and giving classes, is a joy. And so my house is now the venue currently for my own work and also for my students. I teach guitar making to quite a few different people and I currently run an evening class on two nights a week and some of my students uh, from the locality around here come up and we spend nice sessions guitar making, which is lovely. It gives the place a bit of a buzz and a bit of excitement and the villagers all know that my students are coming tonight. They ask me, are your students coming tonight? Los alumnos? I say, yeah, yeah, they're coming tonight at five. And so they, they're curious as to what happens in there. And uh, little by little, I hope to maybe start teaching uh, to some of the Spaniards. And I think this might be a, a great opportunity to perhaps revitalise the, the culture of the guitar here, which would go hand in hand with the Andres Segovia International Guitar Competition and uh, the various flamenco people that do live in the locality. So, this is a story waiting to be told. This is actually the second workshop I've had in La Jalura. I've been here for about four months and set the whole place up on two levels. On this floor here, I have all my power tools. I have a bandsaw, I have a sander thicknesser. This is the dirty, dusty part of the operation. Everything's downstairs and all the rough, raw cuttings and things I put straight into my fireplace to keep myself warm.
Coming upstairs into this lovely space, with all my hand tools positioned around me, this is where I follow on from the basic preparation of the material, going through the process of construction, the bending of the sides, the putting into the mould, the gluing on the back, the, the, the preparation of all the inlays and the bindings, the fingerboard goes on up here, the bridge goes on up here, and then I do, do all the polishing to achieve a beautiful finish on the instrument. This is the first stage of guitar making, the preparation of the neck from its basic raw material. This is called Cedrella odorata, or in English layman's terms, smelly cedar. It's a beautiful smell. So I'm going to start by planing in the vise. Basic woodwork. So we go from here, a plank, to an almost finished neck. Lots more work to do. Just marking out the shape of the heel. El tacón. And I'm going to start carving this nice flamenco pointy heel. The majority of my clients are and were from the UK and still are from the UK. Now these, this can pose problems because you may think that's going to, coming to Spain would have given me more kudos. Coming to Spain, I've now got Granada on my label, being one of the capitals of the guitar world, and this would have given me a lot of kudos, which it has, and, um, and it will continue to do so. But the, the experience of a player ordering an instrument is that they're there and they come to the workshop, they see the workshop, they see the instrument being made, and for them, this is that, that's a very important aspect of ordering an instrument. If then you order an instrument and you're 2,000 miles away from your client in England, there's a lot, lot more based on trust, a lot more um, reliance on things like email, telephone, letter even. And um, it's a completely different experience. So I've had to reassure a lot of my customers that um, I haven't just disappeared up uh, some mountain track, which, which of course I have. And, um, and in the early days of my, my being here, uh, I did actually lose a couple of customers because they wanted to have the experience of being there and seeing the instrument. So that was a bit of a shock for me. I, I assumed that they would think it would be the positive thing, which most of the people do. So coming here, obviously, for me, it's starting afresh. It's starting new. I've got my orders, but I'm having to recreate how I'm going to be working. And so I'm now uh, fundamentally focusing on my instruments. And then here we have the finished heel. It's a beautiful form. This is a wedge system of holding the side that comes up into the heel. So imagine that's a piece of side, that's your side. Then the wedge pops in there. And creates a really strong Strong connection. Beautiful. Just beginning to expose the inlays sandwiched onto the front of the head there. This is a beautiful gouge from Switzerland. And this is a safety gouge. It means it can't cut into these edges because of the way it's shaped like that. Just now finishing off the shape with a fine file. This particular neck is for one of my current orders for a client in Scotland who's a great flamenco player. He already has one of my guitars and I'm making him a special guitar, a uh, flamenco guitar out of spruce and cypress. This will be his, uh, he's got a rosewood flamenco guitar uh, called a flamenca negra, black flamenco. And now he's going to have a blanca, a white flamenco guitar, so we'll have a black and white flamenco, two, two flamenco guitars, black and white, to complete his collection. Every guitar maker puts elements into his instruments which uh, signify that it's their instrument. And those points really are the head design, the shape of the actual instrument, the rosette going around the sound hole. And so 
I'm just finalising this, which is obviously my flamenco head design. I'm flamencoising the top of the head now. This is the flamenco head, and this is the classical head. This one's much softer, this one's much tougher, sharper. To build one guitar, I would suggest it takes about uh, 100 hours. I used to time myself to the minute when I was in a workshop in England, and I had a little book that I used to write my start time, my finish time, and then at the end of the day I added up my hours. And then I, uh, over a period of time, I could see then see exactly how long it took me to make the instruments. There you go, that's rosewood from Brazil. It's slightly char, but um, it will clean up and the colours will all come out. And that's the basic shape now of, uh, of the guitar, which then needs to be refined by hand. This is the initial bending process here. This is the process of uh, fine-tuning the, the curvature of the sides. So what I'm doing is I'm putting the timber to the hot iron, keeping it connected, contacted until it's too hot to touch and the timber becomes elastic and then I then form the final curve into that and then take it away, let it cool, let it cool down and the timber sets into the shape that you want and it's a, it's a sort of long process of, of refinement and it's probably one of the hardest processes in guitar making. A lot of people have a huge problem doing this. This is the front and I've laid out a system you don't really see what happens inside the instrument because normally you just see the face and you don't you see the bridge and the strings and things like that but you don't really know people don't really understand what happens inside and the front's very thin it's about two and a half millimeters thin and in order for it not to collapse and to start to distort with the tension of the strings we have to place on an arrangement of, of, of struts these are called fan struts and they support the instrument and they get carved to a certain um, weight and size so that you've just got the right amount of flexibility to the top. So what I'm doing, having drawn out the, the pattern of the strutting system, I'm now just marking the length of the struts, snipping them off. So now I've got my arrangement of struts all ready to, to go on. All the tools I use have to be absolutely um, super sharp. There's no point of using a blunt tool or, or a tool that's not right for the job. I'm sharpening Japanese chisels with a Japanese water stone. It produces an edge like a razor blade. So I'm just going to apply the glue to the strut. position, take a homemade go bars with a spring inside and they force it down into this dish which is a curved dish which keeps it strong. If you imagine a curved shape is far more resistant to, to down push than a flat shape and then just clean off the last remnants of the glue, squeeze out and that's my first strut. Both of these tops have my signature rosette. We can see this is made out of a mosaic, tiny little dots, half a millimetre square, made by producing tiles. It's a quite long, complicated process. Each tile is angled slightly so that it goes round the form. And this is called herringbone here. This is made up and then bent, loosely bent, and then all fitted in at once, and then all smoothed off and cleaned. People often say, that's a lovely transfer. And you say, I say it's not a transfer, it's, it's inlaid wood.